Hello friends, hi everyone. It's me, Adrian Lee, the Wandering Art Historian. Thanks for coming back for yet another video in our web series, How to Read a Painting. We're creeping up on the end here, everybody. What's our final topic? We're talking about stories, repeated stories that we see again and again, visually depicted throughout art history. This video is dedicated to religious stories and because we're talking mostly about Western art history, a lot of these, uh, these stories that we're gonna talk about today are from the Christian faith. Uh, so you would see these in a church type setting, which we've already seen quite a few religious stories depicted. I'm gonna show you this incredible mosaic. This is quite, quite old, um, Byzantine, they might call it. It's from around 1143 AD um, in Palermo, Italy. Can you tell what religious story we are talking about just by looking at it? Let me point out a few things. So here we have this nice lady, all in blue. Mm -hmm. um, she has a halo, so she's definitely pretty holy. Um, she has this kind of white, cloth that she is sitting on. It kind of creates an outline around her, doesn't it? Um, here she's got her baby who also has an, a halo and he is swaddled up pretty tight. Um, we've got some animals nearby. Here we have an ox and a donkey. Everything is taking place in this kind of cave. Hmm, interesting. Uh, we've got this gentleman over here off to the side He's a little bit older. He's off to the side. Um, hmm, you, you probably know who he is. Um, we've got some shepherds here and uh, these winged creatures are uh, clearly making an announcement of some sort. And then we've got this really cool star um, here in the sky with a direct line back down to this baby. So with all of those clues, what religious story do you think we're gonna be talking about? That's right, this is a depiction of the nativity. Um, basically the first Christmas, the birth of Jesus. Uh, this story goes by a lot of different names, but we're gonna call it the nativity. Um, just a few things that I wanna point out to you. Uh, I think it's very interesting that Mary is completely in blue, um, but we have this cloth around her. It creates almost like a full body halo. And I like that it's in white, a reference to her innocence and purity. We've talked about that a few times already. That would make this guy who, that's right, that's St. Joseph, um, not Jesus' real dad, right? Kind of Jesus' stepdad. And he's often depicted off to the side. Um, we have this very interesting depiction here of some maid servants with the baby Jesus and um, a little container of water. I think that's a really cool reference to um, the idea of baptism. They look like they're about to wash baby Jesus and give him a bath but that's kind of foreshadowing the idea of being baptized. Um, and Jesus's cousin, St. John the Baptist, right? Um, I wanna point out, do you notice the swaddling on baby Jesus? I gotta say, maybe don't swaddle your babies quite that much because doesn't he kind of look like a mummy? Now, I mean no disrespect, but I think that's very interesting because I think this is the artist foreshadowing Jesus's fate, which we all know is that he gives his life for his faith, right? Almost suggesting that Mary knows this already and this depiction of Jesus foreshadows the fact that even on a day of celebration, the birth of Jesus, it's also got a, a tinge of sadness because Mary knows his destiny, right? Okay, uh, let's keep with this idea because 
you know, Christmas is kind of a big deal here in the United States, right? Seems like a joyful celebration, but a lot of artists throughout art history definitely put in reminders that it was a kind of a somber event as well. Let's look at another example. This epic triptych, remember we've uh, talked a few, talked about a few diptychs, that's two panels, and a triptych would be three panels, one, two, three, bing, bang, boom. Um, this is referred to as the Portinari altarpiece from about 1475. Why is that? It's named after the patrons. Um, and they were, it was a very wealthy Italian banker and his family. And that's actually who you see in the two side panels. Um, here is the dad with his two sons and their two patron saints. And over there you see the mom with their daughter and their two female patron saints. That's kind of cool. You get the whole family and their saints in there, right? I mean, if you paid for it, why not, right? Let us take a closer look at this center panel, shall we? Because this is what we really want to talk about, the nativity scene, right? Um, we have all of our regular symbols and characteristics. Do you notice we've got the Virgin Mary here in the center of this painting? Everything emanates from her, right? Covered completely in blue. In fact, she's physically larger than everybody else in this painting besides who? This gentleman right here. Who's this guy? Off to the side older, in shadow, yes, Saint Joseph. Interesting, entirely in red, the human color, right? Uh, we've got an assortment of angels with very colorful outfits and robes and wings. Um, now, do you notice how everyone is really focused on Jesus? Where is Jesus? Well, um, Jesus is on the ground in this depiction. We're, we'll come back to that but you see how everyone is really focused. Um, here we have some shepherds, and if you look in the distance, there is an angel speaking to the rest of the shepherds saying, get over to that, that scene, all that hullabaloo going over there. Jesus was born, shepherds, you gotta go check it out. Um, so this would be referred to as an adoration, and particularly of the shepherds. So it's not just a nativity scene, it's an adoration of the shepherds. They've come to adore baby Jesus. Um, we're in our shelter, kind of a stable barn-ish, and we have our ox and our donkey. Now, if you remember, um, the ox is a definite symbol uh, associated with uh, Western religion. Um, the idea of, you know, steadfastness and um, uh, being a servant and steady trudging along in your faith. And why is the donkey? Well, remember, um, Joseph takes Mary to Bethlehem on a donkey. So that is probably the donkey that they rode. It's also another foreshadowing to the idea that Jesus rides into Jerusalem on what? A donkey, yes, for the last few days of his life. So let's circle back to baby Jesus on the ground, right? That doesn't seem right. Don't put your babies on the ground. Um, two things we've already learned. Don't overly swaddle your babies so that they look like mummies and don't put your babies on the ground. So why in this particular depiction has the artist chosen to put baby Jesus on the ground? Well, it does reference um, a vision had by a saint. Um, saint Bridget of Sweden actually had a vision of the nativity and in that vision, she saw Jesus on the ground instead of in a manger. I know there's a whole song about a way in a manger, right? However, this saint saw Jesus on the ground, and I thought that was so interesting. Why on the ground? Well, this artist gives us clues in these symbols here where we see flowers, um, we see lilies, um, we also see um, uh, 
blue iris like we saw in a previous painting. And remember that iris is associated with uh, the Virgin Mary um, because of uh, her sadness and her pain during the death of Christ. Um, what's also interesting is, um, do you see the sheaf of wheat? What the heck is this sheaf of wheat? Well, that could be a reference to many things. However, um, wheat is what's used to bake bread, right? And Jesus is the bread of life, right? And this also foreshadows the Last Supper where they, Jesus and his disciples broke bread together. And that ends up being a model for the Eucharist or communion. So yeah, there's a lot of symbols going on here. They all tie back to baby Jesus. And do you notice that the sheaf of wheat parallels Jesus on the ground? Um, another thing to remember is that there's that line from uh, the Old Testament, um, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. Human beings, when they die, they return to the soil or they return to the earth. So in a sense, with all of these flower references, the sheaf of wheat and Jesus being placed on the ground on the day of his birth, this artist is trying to remind us that while this is a joyful celebration, it's going to end very, with, in a very sad way with Jesus giving up his life for his faith. I think that's a really good foreshadowing. Good job, artist. Um, let's look at another couple of images, shall we? Um, now, poof. These are some pretty dark paintings, aren't they? So the painting on the left here is by Correggio, and the painting on the right is by our friend Caravaggio, who we haven't seen a few paintings from for a few videos, but gotta toss him back in there every once in a while. I think it's interesting that both of these paintings are very dark and take place at night. However, they feel very different from each other, don't they? I have to say, the Caravaggio painting feels kind of sad and dark and like the scene is filled with melancholy. It's very somber and pensive. While this painting by Correggio actually seems kind of joyful, right? Let's take a closer look. With this particular painting, the first thing that you notice is, where is the light coming from? And if you said, wow, it is actually emanating from Mary and baby Jesus outwards, you would be right. Look at the reaction of these shepherds here. This shepherdess is so blinded by the light created by Mary and Jesus that she's actually kind of covering her eyes, right? Um, it's a very interesting uh, scene because it does look like we're in a stable of some sort. We have a she a shepherd and two shepherdesses yes, um, who have come to adore Christ. So another adoration of the shepherds. Um, here we have this, oh, that's Joseph. He's wrangling the donkey, right? Um, we've got some angels here who've decided to swoop in and admire the scene. Um, I love this artistic choice. Do you notice that the shepherd's dog has uh, joined the scene and is intently focused on the baby. And I think that's a really cool reference because dogs and fidelity and loyalty, typically in marriage, but Correggio could be suggesting that these shepherds are now loyal to Christ or Jesus because they witnessed this epic scene. That's pretty cool, right? Also, do you see the X? We've seen this in quite a few paintings, how the artist creates an X in the scene, right? You ready for this? Here we've got the one line of the X and it's created with Saint Joseph and his position with the donkey going through the middle of the scene and carried with the leg of the shepherd. Do you see that? It's awesome, I know, so where's the other X? Well, the X starts up here. Um, 
interesting that Correggio had the shepherd in this very unusual dramatic pose to create this X, right? Right up here, all the way down through the manger to create the other line. And the middle of the painting right here where Jesus and Mary are. I, good job, Correggio. Love it. Now, uh, Caravaggio's take seems super sad compared to something like this. Um, sure, the focus is right here at the bottom. We see Mary's face very somber and pensive. She's looking at Jesus. Jesus is on the ground again in this particular painting. And while we've got this very dramatic angel that has swooped in to announce the birth of Christ, it still feels like a moment where everyone is just really trying to comprehend the gravity of the situation. And it's almost like everybody else is maybe just focused on the moment, but boy, Mary's almost like predicting the future. It's almost like she's looking into her son's destiny and knowing that he will die for his faith. Um, very cool uh, uh, contradictions, if you will, or comparisons between the two. Check out this nativity depiction. Okay, so uh, we have all of our regular symbols, right? Here we have Mary in blue. Here we have Joseph off to the side. We've got our ox and our donkey. What I think is very interesting is that this artist not only has Jesus on the ground, but to emphasize how holy this scene is, do you notice Joseph's shoes are off. Yes, out of respect that they are aware they are standing on holy ground. What's very cool is, do you see this architectural detail around the painting? Yeah, that's not actually stone. It's painted to look like carved stone. Pretty impressive, right? Who do we have depicted here? Well, we have Adam and Eve on top of these very tall columns, right? And do you notice that there are these two humans here holding up these columns? It looks like they're struggling under the weight of these columns. And what an interesting metaphor for Adam and Eve. Remember, they were driven out of Eden, out of paradise, because they were disobedient and they ate the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil when God said, that's the one thing you weren't supposed to do. So this artist is quite literally saying because of Adam and Eve's sin and disobedience, humans have been carrying that around on their backs like a heavy weight ever since. And why would you tie that in with a nativity scene? Because Jesus came to undo what Adam and Eve did. He's going to set everything right. How cool is that? Just to drive the point home, we have scenes from the book of Genesis here, and we have two figures at war with each other, basically saying what Adam and Eve did had very profound effect, war, famine, terrible things happening to humanity, but Jesus's arrival on the scene will undo all of that. I think that's pretty cool. Um, do you notice something about this depiction? Not only is Jesus on the ground, but he is on the cloak of the Virgin Mary. Now, why is that? Well, Let's take a step, let's take this a step further, okay? First of all, here we have Jesus in the dead center of this painting, right? And do you notice how he is looking straight up? So let's follow his gaze. <gasps> do you notice this perfect triangle created by the beams of the stable? Interesting, right? And do you notice that that triangle is pointing up towards the heavens? Yes, right? Do you notice that the color blue becomes stronger as it gets closer and closer to the heavens? Right, excellent. Do you also notice 
that we've got this other triangle that's pointing back down, right? And in the midst of this, it looks like a piece of wood has been broken off, right? However, what's so cool about this piece of broken wood is that there's a little tiny green shoot growing up out of that. So this idea, you know, the ashes to ashes, dust to dust, our bodies return back to the soil after we die. If you think about that, it's kind of implying that because of Jesus, we have new life. Even when Jesus dies, we are given new life, implied by this green shoot coming out of this broken piece of wood. That's pretty cool metaphor, if you ask me. Now, let's take it a step further, shall we? Christ is on the ground, but on his mother's robe, and we actually see that particular motif a couple of times. Um, you may know it as the Pieta. Um, that's the scene where Mary cradles um, the body of her dead son after he has been removed from the cross and before he is wrapped for burial. So that could be a reference to this scene right here where we see two different depictions of the body of Christ after he has been removed from the cross. Again, reminding us that while this is a celebration of life and a new life for us humans, right? Because Jesus came, it's also a reminder that it came at a cost. Jesus had to give his life so that we could have a new one, right? That's, that's pretty cool. Good job, artists. Um, I wanna tell you another story. Now, technically it is a religious story. However, the person that is involved in this story has kind of taken on a mythic level, like a legendary interpretation over time, okay? And who is this person? Well, she's referenced in this fresco by Giotto over here on the right at the feet of Christ. She is crying over his feet. Her hair is down. And who would this be? It is Mary Magdalene. She is such a fascinating religious figure because her life story goes kind of off the rails. Okay, so first of all, um, we have stories of uh, Mary Magdalene uh, in the first four books of the New Testament. Remember, those are referred to as um, the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the evangelists, right? And those depict, or those tell the story of Jesus' life, right, from four different perspectives. And it's because of the four different perspectives that we don't have a whole lot of information on Mary herself. So first of all, let's just say there were quite a few women followers of Jesus. Um, we know about the 12 guys um, who hung out with Jesus, right? The 12 disciples. But there were a lot of women that hung out with Jesus and the 12 disciples. We just don't have a record of all of their names. So that makes things a little murky. Like who was who, right? How do you keep track? Um, so some speculate that Mary Magdalene was a wealthy woman who supported um, Christ's ministry through her resources, through her wealth. Um, some say Mary Magdalene was a woman uh, who was possessed by demons and Jesus cast those demons out of her and then she followed Christ, okay? Um, we do have the story of Mary who um, anointed the feet of Jesus. She cried over them and anointed them with oil and then took her long hair and wiped all of that off there. So we have that story. Um, some suggest that she was a prostitute who um, decided to not be a prostitute anymore and to follow Jesus instead. However, that's actually been kind of um, disqualified, if you will. We don't say that Mary Magdalene was a prostitute anymore because we don't know for 100% sure. Um, but because we have all of these like half stories, what we see happen in art history 
and in the church at large is that all of these stories get mashed up into one story and that becomes the story of Mary Magdalene. It's almost like she's an amalgam of all these unnamed women followers of Jesus, right? Um, that feels kind of sad, right? Because I would like to know about all these other ladies, but it does create a very interesting backstory for Mary Magdalene. Let's look at this particular depiction because this is by our friend Artemisia Genileski. Yes, we've seen quite a few of her paintings already. Number one, check out that amazing epic yellow gold dress. I don't think that this is a reference to uh, the idea of yellow being a, a color of betrayal. I just think it's maybe referencing the wealthy part of Mary Magdalene's conjured up story, right? Do you notice that um, her, her dress is kind of slipping off and she's got a lot of skin exposed? That would be a reference to the idea that people believe she was a prostitute, okay? Um, do you see her hair is kind of unkempt and she has this very distraught look on her face. We often see Mary Magdalene with this look on her face kind of overwhelmed by everything she saw and everything she experienced in her life. She's sitting on a pretty epic chair, which I will point out has Artemisia's signature on it in the same yellow gold of uh, Mary Magdalene's dress. Very cool. And she's got her hand on what looks like a, a book or a box. It's hard to see because it's um, so dark. Um, but what is very interesting is that in that same yellow gold that we see with the signature and the dress, there are some words in Latin. So what is the translation of these Latin words? Well, first of all, whenever you hear Bible verses in Latin, you know that's St. Jerome's doing, right? He translated the Bible into Latin. That gives us the Vulgate. But what those words translate to um, is this, optimum partum legit, which means has chosen. Why would Artemisia include that? Well, it is a reference to the story of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. Yes, in art history and the church at large, poor Mary Magdalene was merged with the Mary, Martha, and Lazarus trio, right? They're siblings who were friends with Jesus. And it's very important because remember in that story, um, well, Lazarus, Jesus rose him from the dead, right? He revived him. Um, and Mary and Martha have that story where they invited Jesus over and Martha was the busy homemaker. She was a good hostess. She was getting everything ready. But Mary sat at the feet of Jesus and just listened to his stories, right? And Martha got really mad and she's like, Jesus, can you please tell Mary to come in here and help me? And he said, Martha, what are you so worried about? I don't care about any of that stuff. Mary has chosen the better route. She just wants to sit here and hang out with me. And that's more important. And Mar Martha was like, oh, shoot, you're right, Jesus, my bad. So that is this reference with the Latin words because he's re uh, Artemisia is referencing Luke 42, 10, which says, but few things are needed or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better and it will not be taken away from her. So that those are the words of Jesus to defend Mary against her sister. Um, boy, already a complicated character, complicated story. Why is Mary Magdalene so darn important? Well, because as the story goes, Jesus knew that he was going to die, but he also told everyone, don't worry, I'm going to come back. I'm going to resurrect three days later. So don't, don't be too heartbroken. It's going to be rough, but I'm going to come back. And it's Mary Magdalene is the first human to see Jesus after he has been resurrected. Here's the story. Three days after his death, Mary goes to the, the tomb um, with her oil, right, uh, to anoint the body. 
and she gets there and the tomb is empty and she starts freaking out, okay? She's panicking. She thinks someone has stolen the, the dead body of her best friend. I mean, come on, who does that, right? So she sees a gardener and she says, excuse me, sir, please help me. My, my friend was buried here three days ago. I can't find his body now. What's happened? What should I do? And when the gardener turns around, she sees that it's actually Jesus. And she goes to hug him, but he says, no, 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 don't touch me just yet. I just rose, I just rose from the dead. I'm gonna go see my dad real quick, but tell all the guys that I did exactly what I said I was gonna do. I totally rose from the dead and that I'm gonna meet up with them later. And she's like, Jesus, this is amazing, awesome. Go see your dad. I'll tell everybody else everything's fine. So she finds the disciples and she's like, y'all aren't gonna believe this, but I just saw Jesus, He totally rose from the dead like he said he was gonna do. He's gonna go see his dad, but then he's gonna meet up with us later. Did the disciples believe her? No, they did not, right? That gets, gives us the whole, you know, uh, doubting Thomas story, et cetera, et cetera. But it was Mary who saw Jesus first after he rose from the dead. So this is a, she's a big character in this story, right? And a really good topic or subject for a lot of amazing paintings, okay? Now, do you notice here we have two additional paintings, two different artists, two different time periods. Um, we've got the beautiful gown referencing her wealth, right? That part of the story, her hair down. Sometimes we see her skin exposed and referencing the fact that she may have been a prostitute, right? Um, we see her with her jar. That's her jar of ointment or oil. Remember, she anointed the feet of Jesus, and then she went to the tomb to anoint Jesus again. I like that this artist chose to show that the ointment is empty, the jar is empty, kind of referencing the empty tomb, right? Very cool. Um, again, kind of this pensive look on her face, like she's overwhelmed by all the events of her life. But what's very cool about this painting on the right, do you see we've got our beautiful, lush, utopian landscape, but we've got kind of like um, a wilderness part here, and that is in reference to what happens to Mary later. Okay, remember how I said her story is kind of legendary and mythic, right? This is where her story gets a little weird and goes a little bit off the rails, okay? What's going on here? Okay, so here's what happens. So Jesus rises from the dead and she tells everybody they don't believe her, fine. The Romans start to persecute the early Christian church, right? They're trying to round up everybody who followed Jesus. And she and her brother and sister, Mary, Martha, Lazarus, they're rounded up by a bunch of pagans and they're set adrift on rafts without food or water to perish at sea. Now, if you're like Adrian, I don't quite remember that part of the story from my last reading of the Bible. Well, you would be correct because this is in a book called The Golden Legend. It was uh, published about 1260-ish AD by Jacobus de Vergine. Um, and basically what he wanted to do was he collected all of the lore all of the epic stories of all of the saints. And it was a bestseller, even for medieval times, okay? Um, and this is where we find the story of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus being set adrift to perish at sea, okay? Do they perish at sea? No, a miracle happens and they end up in Marseille, France. You gotta go with me on this one. I told you it was gonna be like a legend or like a myth and I wasn't messing around. What else is going on? Well, in Marseille, France, Mary actually performs a number of miracles. However, she is very overcome and overwhelmed by all of the things that have happened to her. And she realizes that um, she's just not cut out for the world 
anymore. And so she's kind of like St. Jerome. Remember we said we see Jerome in the guise of the scholar. Uh, we see Jerome in the guise of the cardinal of the church, but also as a hermit. And that's what Mary Magdalene decides to do. She decides to stop wearing clothes because hermits don't wear clothes. Uh, she decides to stop eating and she decides to just go out into the wilderness away from all of humans, all the humans of the world, to just really pray and ponder everything she's lived through and just kind of focus on that. That's what you're seeing here in this particular depiction of Mary Magdalene. So yes, even women became hermits. In this case, do you notice Mary's hair is just growing and growing and growing? Yes, uh, as part of the legend, her hair grew to cover her so that she didn't have to wear clothes and she would remain modest. Interesting. Remember how I said she decided to stop eating, okay? Well, God sent manna from heaven and she would just eat that every day. So he was still trying to help her out, right? So here you see Mary deep in prayer and in concentration. We see her ointment jar, again, empty. And this is the, um, all of her crazy story coming together in this one particular scene. Um, when she dies, um, angels come and carry her to heaven. So that's pretty cool. Check out this depiction. It's a sculpture by Donatello. Um, Look at her hair has become like a dress, but do you notice she looks very gaunt and thin and almost sickly? Yeah, well, she's only eating the manna from heaven, right? Look at these two depictions. I think these are very interesting. Look at how the artist has carved her covered in hair. A um, little disconcerting that they still decided to depict her breasts exposed. Uh, despite the fact that she never really was a prostitute, okay? Um, but I love these very interesting depictions of her um, being escorted to heaven by these angels at the end of her life. Really incredible story, isn't it? But uh, a clear choice is why artists would want to depict it, right? Thank you so much for joining me for another video. You're so awesome. If you have a dollar to donate to my uh, virtual tip jar, that would be super cool. If not, be sure to like these videos, share them with your friends and subscribe to my YouTube channel. My name is Adrienne Lee. You can call me the Wandering Art Historian. Thank you. And I will see you next time for our last video together. I can't believe it. Thank you so much. I'll see you then. Bye.